So I'm Jessica Lang. I'm the interim dean of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this afternoon to this really wonderful event, our third and final program in the We Are Climate Action series for fall for the fall 2021 semester. This afternoon's topic, which I find immensely compelling, is climate change artists respond. And I think all gathered here understand that art and artists have an unusual and powerful gift, maybe even a responsibility, to shape, challenge, provoke, inform, educate, and inspire us. And that's never been more necessary than with climate change in our current moment. I am delighted to welcome artists Mary Mattingly, Anina Gerchik, Xavier Cortada, and Catherine Behar. The panel was organized by art historian Julie Rees. I want to especially extend my thanks to Beth Harpaz, the communications manager for the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences, for all that she's done in getting us here at this moment right now. And I also want to extend my thanks and gratitude to Mindy Engel Friedman, who's been a tireless advocate for awareness and action around climate change and has done so much to educate and inspire the Baruch community. So thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to turn the floor over now to Julie and Catherine. Well, you know what, I might say just a few more words before we get going. And that is just to say that I'm, we're so grateful to have this amazing panel today. Um, as Dean Lang just said, our artists bring so much to us. They bring their connection to the environment and climate. Um, they, have a tr they translate that passion and their internal life um, for us so we can better understand um, what is out there and what does it mean to us. They, um, they bring their emotional life, their intellectual life, their spiritual life, their artistic life to us and they share it with us and it illuminates us, it challenges us. I was thinking today when I was speaking to my class, I was asking them, how many of you plan to speak about climate change or environmental issues with your family at Thanksgiving? And so many of them said it was so difficult to talk about that. But it's interestingly, it's not difficult to talk about art. When you see art, you want to talk about it. There's something about art that compels you and it feels like it needs discussion. So I feel so lucky today that we have you to join us and open us up and um, explore some important issues with us. We'll start off today. Um, let me start off by introducing our co-moderator, Catherine Behar. She is the Associate Professor of New Media Arts, and she is the Deputy Chair of Art, Fine, and Performing Arts Department at Baruch. She is also the Deputy Director of the Master's Program in Data Analysis and Visualization at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. We are so happy to have her. Catherine, lead the way. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Mindy and Jessica, um, for getting us started. So it is, I will be speaking a little bit more momentarily, but it's my pleasure now to introduce the person who put this incredible event together, Dr. Julie Reese. Julie holds a PhD in art history from the CUNY Graduate Center. Her research is focused on art and the climate crisis. She has spoken on related panels, including shifting domains, artists respond to the threatened ecological commons. This was with Marfa Ballroom Dialogues and Landscape and the Anthropocene at the College Art Association. She is the editor of the incredibly important volume, Art Theory and Practice in the Anthropocene. And in 2019, she organized the symposium, The Role of Art in the Environmental Crisis, held at Christie's Education. And she was the guest critic on the same theme for the Brooklyn Rail. A pioneering scholar in the field of installation art, she is also the author of From Margin to Center, The Spaces of Installation Art. So Julie, thank you so much for being here at Baruch. And I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you to Baruch College for hosting this event. I'm grateful to the artists who are with us today for generously sharing their time and talking about their work with us. Today's unprecedented level of human-caused global climate change has given rise to a worldwide call for action towards a sustainable ecological future. 
lawyers, elected officials, climate scientists, and engineers are among those seeking ways to mitigate and adapt to an unstable future. Contemporary artists are playing an important role as well, contributing to the cultural shift necessary for generating action. Artists expand the field of climate change communication, and sometimes they model solutions. At times working in partnership with community members and with professionals from other disciplines, they create artworks that raise awareness of the destructive environmental impacts of individual and industrial activity. They draw our attention to the disproportionate effect of climate change on those who contribute the least to the carbon emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. They speak for and they speak to the non-human world and remind us that we are but part of it. An artist is never simply a mirror, nor a pair of rose-colored glasses for the world to see through, nor must they illustrate data. It is not their responsibility to make science accessible. Instead, they can choose to transform scientific concepts and filter them through their individual sensibilities, finding a unique way to give tangible form to the invisible. Their art can help awaken resolve and shape our next steps, changing the message and cultivating alternative narratives. The artists on this panel have addressed issues ranging from the privatization of drinking water and future flooding of populous urban areas to the possibility of human extinction. As agents of cultural change, they can help us come together to confront ecological threats, uh, which I think is a a pretty great thing just, just in that, that last bit. I'm gonna be keeping the bios very short so that we have the most time possible to hear from the artists. But the first artist we're gonna hear from this afternoon is Mary Mattingly. Mary Mattingly's art practice centers on ecological concerns and fosters a reciprocal re relationship between humans and nature. She often has a strong educational component to her work and works collaboratively with communities and other stakeholders. She founded Swale, an edible floating forest that makes fresh produce available for free in New York Harbor. Her recent work, Vanishing Point, focuses on the evolution of plant life in the Thames estuary over millions of years as the climate has changed. She recently launched Public Water with More Art uh, which included an installation you might have seen this summer in Brooklyn's Prospect Park, a 10-foot geodesic dome filled with native plants that filtered water mimicking New York's gravity-fed watershed. Her work has been shown around the world from Storm King to Cuba and Korea, uh, both as discrete objects and as site-specific projects as well. And I'm now just going to turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Julie. Um... I'm gonna screen share and I'll just, I'll just get started. So I rely on photography and sculpture and often on the structures of public art in order to co-build living systems and storytell through materials and their histories and to center those stories um, on socio-ecological concerns that foster reciprocity between humans and humans and humans and every being we're connected to. I pay attention to how these ecosystems work and to what happens when small changes take place. Um, so in one way or another, these projects have always related to water. Um, I've enacted my, <coughs> excuse me, my ongoing concern for water through our often via more absurd storytelling around water-based sculptures and installations. Um, so human-made living systems on the water have I believe a way of standing apart and um, being reflected upon as a space where small changes in an ecosystem can be seen and learned from by visitors and potentially attended to and maybe even corrected by stewards. I, it wasn't until 2020 that I focused on drinking water at home or where I've lived for 20 years in, in New York City. So the New York City drinking watershed supplies over a billion gallons of water daily to about 9 million New York City residents and visitors. It's considered one of the healthier water systems um, currently in the world, but for generations, city residents have been able to access this water supply without much of a sense of 
the backstory and therefore maybe without much of a need for responsibility and reciprocity. So this is an image from a year of public water. It began as a campaign with more art and more arts, a, um, a, a nonprofit public arts organization in New York City um, to bring attention to the rarely seen labor that humans and non-humans do to care for New York City's drinking water. So it highlights the stories of New York City's water supply system from deep time to the present day while focusing on examining ongoing issues of water quality, access and infrastructure challenges uh, facing New York City's drinking watershed. So many of New York City's histories when it comes to the watershed are messy and cruel. Uh, the century of expansions came at enormous expenses to those in what is considered watershed territory now and to those including many indigenous communities who were pushed out along the way. Uh, New York City's drinking water system has involved violent land grabbing, genocide, privatization, uh, revolts, sicknesses, um, fire, deliberate and illegal destruction of properties and communities, power, public partnerships, labor and negotiation. And only in the last 40 years does that story really start to grow to include listening and specifically listening to people outside of New York City, um, but who steward land in what is now considered New York City's drinking watershed territory. So a year of public water was launched in the spring of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. In a state of disaster around the pandemic, it was important to talk about water and the interconnectedness of systems people rely upon for health and well being. So, an underlying concern with every disaster is that they provide the cover for big business to essentially retool public goods for private wealth. Um, so, we knew it was a duty to keep conversations about public versus private water in the forefront on the heels of the Flint water crisis, um, water shutoffs in Detroit in the beginning of the pandemic, and ongoing deep infrastructural problems around lead in drinking water. In New York City today, amidst all of the struggles embedded in the water system, we have a public water system that provides profuse and relatively clean water at a considered, considerable low cost, or what's considered a low cost, I suppose. Um, and, and this should be celebrated. So uh, yet yeah, for people who live in the watershed area in the rest of the state, the rules of the watershed tend to dictate their lives and their livelihoods, how they can farm, what businesses can exist, um, what lands they have access to, and ongoing support of people working and living in these communities is a responsibility. Um, aside from being a New York City resident, this project was connecting for me. I grew up close to the drinking watershed territory, but in an area uh, where the watershed wasn't protected and chemicals like DDT were sprayed on farms and entered the water table well into the 1980s after the chemical was banned. We couldn't drink the tap water then, and years later now the town relies on a private water company. Uh, today that water is just as unhealthy just now with essentially a different set of carcinogens. Um, people there pay a steep price in health and well-being. Um, so in a public water system like New York City's, I know that I'm reliant on those who live within and protect the drinking watershed on behalf of city residents. Um, watershed core in Prospect Park in Brooklyn tries to mimic the watershed of New York City, so that 200 square miles of land in upstate New York. Um, it's a 10 foot tall geodesic sphere that's designed as a structural ecosystem that's covered in plants found in the riparian areas of the watershed. So those um, plants could include bulrush and cattail and some that are less known for cleaning water, um, but they filter water in a gravity fed system that mimics the geologic features of the watershed. Um, Rainwater can enter the catchment basins at the top of the sphere and can seep through a system of piping where it's filtered through gravity and um, different rows of plant beds. It flows into a smaller drinking water container um, that collected the purified water near the bottom portion of the sculpture. So the ecosystem is visible through these flexible and permeable screens that shroud the sphere. It's important to note, I think, that in more ways than when the pandemic uh, changed the trajectory of the sculpture. So with more art, we had planned to work with a group of residents who live in the watershed area and who would 
share stories from people in the watershed while serving New York City residents clean rainwater that made its way through the sculpture. Um, we worked with watershed groups in upstate New York to prepare for this, but in the end, health concerns about too much interaction, um, including serving water was too great. So I think public art as a proposal, um, I, I always think about it as needing maintenance and flexibility, even more so than the initial impulse in order to enact change. Um, during the pandemic, we've learned so much more about flexibility and this ended up in this project leading to expansion in other areas. Uh, so educational components of public water became increasingly complex here. We worked with schools in Brooklyn and Manhattan and the Bronx to design water filtration systems, um, some in person and some online. And through a series of meetings in Prospect Park, we were able to co-design invisible ecosystems, which is a self-guided walking tour um, that connects the sculpture to the park, to the watershed. So core was a sculptural preface to watershed core, and this is an image, a partial image of it in January of 2020 at the culmination of uh, an artist residency at the Brooklyn Public Library. Core was situated in the lobby. It contained live tropical plants with varieties found in the fossil record in the New York area. I think, and this is probably my favorite picture of it um, during an event or a festival right before the pandemic. Um, I think at first glance, this was part of a timeline that evoked the geologic histories of the life of the watershed, but read in another way, it also spoke to New York's potential futures by looking to the past and the fossil record of New York's, uh, the New York City area in the Cenozoic area, which is about 50 million years ago, um, to, to look at uh, what New York City was like um, with 1,000 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, which is a prediction um, uh, if, if carbon isn't curbed uh, in industrial nations. Um, so I've enacted a similar idea in different contexts. Uh, for the project on the left, Arctic Food Forest, uh, was in Anchorage, Alaska. It's public art as a strategy to co-vision another potential for public space. So it was looking at food forestry, um, but based on the geologic records in Alaska and, and potentials for war a warming Arctic. Uh, it was co-designed with, with people in, uh, in terms of what they were interested in harvesting. Um, on the right, along the lines of displacement, relied on tropical fruit trees that were transplanted in upstate New York from Florida to make something that was uh, attempting to be uncanny or something that you would have to look twice at in order to see a living sculpture on the, on the museum's grounds that would be able to actually survive there in 15 years and is predicted to thrive in, in the next 40 years. Um, so like along the lines of displacement, swale is a plant-based artwork and also an intentional provocation. Here it's a floating public edible landscape on a reclaimed barge that was launched in 2016 in Concrete Plant Park in the Bronx with the help of many individuals and organizational partners, including Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, Lower East Side Ecology Center, Bronx River Alliance, The Point, and, and even New York City Parks Department. Um, the point was to look at growing or picking food on New York City's public land. It's been illegal for almost a century for the fear that a glut of foragers could destroy an ecosystem. So permitted as a public artwork, Swale used the common laws of the water as a loophole to do what's illegal on public land. So it was a platform where anyone could pick fresh foods for free, um, still considered a illegal public act when committed on public land in a largely privatized city with litigious concerns that often outweigh those of the common good. So Swale came out of learning that in addition to 100 acres of community garden space in New York City, the city actually cares for 30,000 acres of public parkland while access to fresh food is still extremely limited. So swales like an architectural folly. If you could imagine a land mass and a small orchard bobbing on the water, it can surprise us and ask us to maybe reconsider our surroundings or see the city in a different way. Um, it follows insights of social scientists like Eleanor Ostrom, who I think is so important to talk about, and others who similarly have claimed that in a vibrant commons, people had a vital role to play not only as beneficiaries, but as co-creators, as protectors, and as decision makers. So we wanted to insist that 
residents could indeed take on some of the role of caring for public lands in our neighborhoods, which is part of a healthy foraging system. We thought swale could not only be a provocation, but also potentially an example of a space that was organized through principles of a, of a working commons. Um, so Swale was also a place where we were able to hold discussions about the concept of public food. Uh, this was probably our largest discussion, uh, was hosted with the U.S. Forest Service's Urban Field Station. Um, and as a result of Swale and the support of community groups in 2017, the Parks Department did open their first land-based pilot, a public foodway at Concrete Plant Park in the Bronx. And on all these projects, but especially on Swale, I've learned how important maintenance is to enacting changes in public spaces. And maybe I'll, I'll talk about that more later, but I wanted to just share uh, like a three minute video of uh, Swale at Concrete Plant Park. The South Bronx in New York City is one of the largest food deserts in the nation with minimal access to fresh, affordable food. A century old ordinance prevents planting in public parks. So rather than solve the problem by land, a new initiative calling itself a floating food forest is approaching it by water. CBSN climbed aboard. Your parents give you $5 and you're like, how am I gonna make these $5 stretch? You're like, oh, could I get a salad? And you find out that it's $9 and you're like, I only have $5. We don't see like fresh mint, fresh peaches, fresh apples, fresh lavender. You don't see it in the local community, in the supermarkets or in the bodegas. So you tend to shy away from the healthy options. And it's sad. Swale is a floating food forest. It's using the language that policies are written in to go around those policies and grow food on water instead of on land because it's illegal to be on land doing this. I heard the term food desert being thrown around because we don't have access to a lot of green, right? A lot of fruits and vegetables that we're able to incorporate into our everyday life. There's people from California, there's people from Brooklyn, there's people from Chicago that came here recently and other places that are able to say like, I live in a food desert or where, where I live close by, there's no access to fresh food that it is unique to black, brown, poor communities. People are already seeing that it's a larger issue and all of these things correlate. High blood pressure, obesity, asthma rates. Most people when they come on here, first of all, they, they're very curious and they don't know what to expect when they walk off that gangway. Once they get here, they're just like, wow, this is so beautiful. But they still don't understand that like you can pick stuff and eat stuff and take stuff home. And when we say like it's free, that's when people are like, oh, okay, this is for me. It's okay to take it from the plants? Yeah. Yes. They said. People cannot believe that there's corn growing on a barge. We want to stop the disconnect and and really and really transform the community so we have more healthy options. The communities that need to grow food the most don't have access to private space. We have to start looking at our parks. We have to start looking at spaces that are underutilized and that we could consider places that we, we can go to for fresh food. You won't believe how amazing Swell and how amazing Concrete Plant Park is until you come and see it. And being able to see that fruits and vegetables can grow in the Bronx it's priceless. Like you can't put a price tag on this stuff because it brings the community together, it informs the community, and it pushes for a better tomorrow and a better Bronx. And I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, that was wonderful. We're just gonna go right on. Um, I'm going to introduce our next artist, Xavier Cortada. A Miami-based artist uses his work to generate awareness and action around climate change and social justice issues. He's created installations at the North and South Poles, including using a moving ice sheet to mark time during a fellowship with the National Science Foundation. His Underwater Homeowners Association project addresses rising sea levels in Florida, uh, where he is professor of practice in the art and art history department at the University of Miami. He's just returned from Glasgow from, the, from COP21, where as an official observer, he's been actively engaged in creating participatory public art projects in dialogue with the goals of the summit. Xavier.
It's my pleasure to be um, with you here today um, to talk a little bit about one of my projects, the Underwater Homeowners Association. This is Miami. It's actually currently located at the McMurdo Dry Valleys in Antarctica. I'm part of a collaborative Antarctic researchers. And when I went to Antarctica with the National Science Foundation in 2006, they let me know that the ice that I was standing on would eventually melt and drown my city. This is where that ice is coming if we continue to do what we have been doing, which is pollute our atmosphere. The dark blue areas you see here are the actual homes of hundreds of thousands of people. And I needed to create a way of alerting them to their vulnerability. So I took those very ice samples from Antarctica and melted them on a piece of paper. I also added the sediment that the scientists gave me. It was art from Antarctica created with Antarctica in Antarctica and through the lens of those who research Antarctica for us. And unlike paintings of the 1850s and the late 19th century, where it talked about how grand nature was, a lot of the art today talks about how we are destroying nature, that we in the Anthropocene are uh, these antagonists against nature. But through this work, I wanted to portray that it is actually nature that is going to destroy us. In many ways, I portrayed the bullet that was going to kill us. And I tried to share the precursor of horrors to come with elected leaders so that leaders, in this case of the state of California and the state of Florida, um, could do more to adapt and to solve the issue of sea level rise in Miami. Problem is they weren't doing enough, so I decided to take matters into my own hand. And I um, went to the water's edge and I started kicking the crap out of it. I thought water is gonna do violence to me. So let me go ahead and beat it up and maybe it would go in the other way. Well, that didn't work. I've always known that violence uh, only begets more violence. So I thought to be a little smarter than that and thought, well, maybe if I freeze the water, right? It used to be ice, but perhaps if I were to freeze the water, then I could uh, have it from, keep it from rising and sinking my city. Um, but um, upon speaking to some scientists, I realized that uh, that was an effort in futility because of course, running the refrigerator would uh, create more greenhouse gases, which would melt more ice, which means I would need more ice trays. And I just thought that, that was not a, a viable option. So instead I came up with this solution and that was just to take the entire ocean, the entire Atlantic ocean and bury it in the sand. I thought that by burying it underground, it would be um, beneath the surface, it wouldn't be above ground and then my home would be saved. But that also turned out to be uh, a false uh, way of looking at things because of course, um, when I dug a hole, I found that there were a bunch of politicians with their heads in the ground, like ostriches, burying their heads to the problem. So there wasn't enough room to put water. So I had to come up with other solutions. For one, um, I needed to let people know that the matter was urgent. And although rising seas is something that was going to happen in a dramatic way decades from now, there were some reasons to be uh, concerned immediately. And I'm not just talking about biodiversity loss and a whole host of catastrophic uh, impacts by us polluting the atmosphere. I was really talking about heat stroke at 3 p.m. So working with the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Red Cross, I had people who probably would not be alive by the time those oceans got to Miami. 
uh, fry eggs on solar panels as a participatory performance to let them know that we were uh, in 2016 um, feeling uh, the hottest summer in recorded history, something that has repeated itself every time since. My work uses the elasticity of art to engage others in problem solving. And it's what I try to do with my art. And I think um, it is the elasticity of art that also allows me to bring in other disciplines. It allows me to help people reframe the way they think, uh, to make them engage and learn in an experiential way, and to uh, allow them to be agents and protagonists in what clearly feels like a hopeless situation. Uh, over here, you see me asking uh, my participants to take their utility bills, fossil fuel electric bills, and put them into paper airplanes and throw them to the sky. Um, it wasn't just the rising cost of utility bills, but also, of course, the rising amounts of parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. On the other side, I did a performance piece where I tried to explain that uh, there is no such thing as clean um, fossil fuels or clean coal. Uh, here at an opening of an exhibit, I intentionally melted a big chunk of ice to be disruptive because Antarctica doesn't care what your plans are. It, uh, it is coming, uh, whether you like it or not. To the right, I had an underwater flotilla looking at people's property um, values and making them into little boats and watching them sink. These are all different types of participatory art projects that I create, that I develop, that I conceptualize as a way of having our community understand uh, its vulnerability. And I needed to do that specifically for Miami-Dade County, a county that has its national, state, and local bird be the building crane. There's nothing but skyscrapers at the water's edge populating and polluting my city. So I wanted us to understand just how vulnerable we were. And I needed to do that in a way that really dealt not with the love for nature, not with the love for others, which is what should drive us in a world that needs more loving and empathetic and caring and forward thinking people. But I created a project that dealt with self interest, the very self interest of a homeowner who did not want the equity, the property value of their home to collapse. So using technology, using an app, I had people write their addresses in an app and find out what their elevation was above sea level. Said another way, how many feet of glacial melt were needed before their homes were submerged. And over here, you look at what happens to Miami-Dade County uh, with less than seven feet of water. All those dark blue areas are people's homes. Importantly, uh, the folks left behind um, are uh, living in a uh, moat uh, filled with sewage uh, and environmental decay. So it's not like the spots that are a little elevated uh, have any um, salvation and clearly the tax base of the entire community uh, would collapse. So the situation is dire and I needed to create an art piece that allowed us to visualize that. So. Importantly, I engaged participants and I um, gave them signs, yard signs that they would put in front of their house to map the elevation, to map the topography of their community to basically assert, attest to the fact that their home was at a certain elevation before above sea level. And clearly, um, the function and the form were in unison here. Normally there's a for sale sign or a political sign in front of that yard um, signs surface. But instead there was this ambiguous sort of number behind it, my Antarctic ice painting melting, basically threatening to come to that front yard. Below it, a water line 
And as that ice melted and that water reached that level, that home would be submerged. We also did it across the community, marking and mapping uh, the community so that the community understand, understood that it wasn't just the folks that were close to the water's edge that were vulnerable, but in a place where the top elevation is 24 feet, the entire community was vulnerable. We also had individuals hand paint their signs, repurposing old political signs. Uh, and to me, that was important because this wasn't a partisan ideological issue. Antarctica could care less what party you belong to. And if your neighbor across the street who doesn't see eye to eye with you on most issues realizes that you're at the same elevation, the same ground, the same vulnerability, that could uh, create enough strangeness in this art piece to open a conversation, have people interact and engage with one another. It also involved people who didn't even live in the area that was affected because as I showed you in that map, whether you live at the north part or the south part of the county, whether you're at 24 feet or at two feet, we are all one community and we are all equally vulnerable because we have three coastlines in Miami-Dade County. The first and obvious coastline is Biscayne Bay, the Atlantic Ocean. And with rising seas, anything along that coast clearly gets um, submerged, especially during a, a storm. Storms that are fueled by a warmer oceans, making them wetter, making them stronger, and making them move slower therefore causing more damage. Um, that is the future of Miami-Dade County. And if you're at the water's edge and you don't have mangroves living shorelines but seawalls, you are going to suffer those consequences. But there's a second coastline. And clearly that coastline is the Everglades. And Miami has a ridge. So sure, you're low at the water's edge, but we mapped it so that you could see that it goes a little bit high up to 24 feet at its highest point. But then it goes downhill, if you will, towards the west coast of Florida, towards the Everglade, where it's at the same elevation, the River of Grass and the Atlantic Ocean are roughly as vulnerable to sea level rise. And the third coastline is the aquifer, the water beneath our feet. So through this particular art project, I explained that with rising seas, saltwater intrusion comes into our aquifer. A series of lectures and conversations explain this by not just having community wisdom, but also having the experts from the universities come and explain it. It's a project that continues to the day. 3,000 of these signs will be distributed all over Little Havana in Miami-Dade County in uh, the spring. And what it does is it invites people to come together, to learn together, to work together, to problem solve. And to me, that is the essence of the art project. It's for you to learn about what's gonna to happen to your flood insurance, what's gonna to happen to your property values, what's going to happen to your community so that you can begin to advocate and perhaps engage others in thinking, not in two year election cycles, but perhaps in, 30 years uh, mortgage, property mortgage time periods. I took the same project and I uh, created an iteration of it for the conference I was just asked, where I wanted uh, individuals to understand that they also shared the same concerns, fears, or purposes, not to look at each other through a partisan or political or patriotic or nation state divide, but instead, what were your shared hopes or feared? What was your elevation? I spoke to people from the Pacific Islands who literally have their homes at the same elevation of mine in Miami. Here's a quick video that shows, it's a two minute video that shows what we did with the Hello Project in um, Glasgow. Yeah, so as you go to Glasgow, I know that you will be, I know that you will be sharing all the wisdom and our stories, but also sharing our elevation. Thank you so much. I'm relatively high at seven feet, Daniela. Thank you so much, Mayor. <laughs>
So thank you very much. Uh, again, I created this project so that we saw each other through our collective vulnerability and not just as individuals, that we were one community and that we were all uh, sharing the same um, reality and the history that we were writing. Um, thank you very much. It's been a true honor to you know, participate and be with you here in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Xavier, and, and don't go away because I'm sure people will have some questions for you later. That was that was wonderful. Um, I you've already met my co-host and moderator for this project at the beginning of the panel today, Catherine Bayer, uh, interdis Behar, interdisciplinary artist and critical theorist of new media. I asked Catherine to share one of her works with this panel because I felt that it interjected many of the same concerns yet in such a different format. And it just seemed like a wonderful opportunity to see a very different way of, of thinking about nature uh, in relationship to technology and in partnership with technology. So Catherine, please, please go right ahead and tell us about your work. Hi, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, um, thank you so much. Thank you everyone um, for being here this afternoon. Thank you to um, Mary and Xavier for um, sharing their work and Julie for organizing this. Um, and I'm really looking forward to Anina's presentation and our discussion. So as you've just heard, um, I run the New Media Arts Program here at Baruch. So I know we have many students here today. And I think that for those of you who know me, you probably know me as a professor. So that makes it a nice change of pace to get to speak with you today in my other capacity, which is as an artist. So I'd like to begin by saying that the project that I'm going to share um, is not something that I thought was going to be about climate change when I made it. I'm best known for artworks that concern the intersections of race, gender, and labor among non-human objects in digital culture. So I'm not known primarily for making art about ecology. But as I think that you'll see, the fact of climate change is a main condition of possibility for this project. And when I say climate change is a condition of possibility, that means that climate change is what makes a project like this even conceivable. The condition of climate change enables an artwork like this to exist. So in the form of a storm, climate change was the occasion for this project. And again, in the form of another storm, climate change became a key agent in this piece. So I'm going to be talking about agency, and I want to explain what I mean by that term. An agent is a figure whose actions have effects in the world. So we are very accustomed to thinking about human agency. For example, many discussions of the climate crisis focus on human agency in terms of what an individual person can do to help. But like my, uh, my predecessors, uh, Mary and Xavier, 
Um, I'm focused on non-human agency here, and this project also has to do with water because, of course, many non-human forces have effects in the world too. So even if their agency isn't respected, for example, by policy, it's undeniable that non-humans, like water, have agency also. And that's where this project comes in. This is Maritime Messaging Red Hook, a site-specific public art project that stages a mock conversation between two such non-human systems, water and an artificial intelligence. So I presented this um, public performance in 2017 on the five-year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, which probably many of you will remember, and you'll recall that it badly impacted the U.S. East Coast, including the Brooklyn neighborhood Red Hook. So I created this work through a technology residency at Pioneer Works, and the project was also co-produced by Portside New York, which are two fantastic nonprofit organizations that are located in Red Hook. So um, on October 29th, 2017, 15 performers journeyed individually and in pairs from Wall Street to Red Hook on NYC ferry boats. Standing as witnesses, they listened to the water and used iPads to broadcast its conversation. So I'm going to play you an excerpt and then we can talk about what's going on. What's your reminder? Got it. The barge was completed in the right of Red Hook, was sailing company in the waters, basins, barges, and the company was a picture of the goods. Do you want to save it? Okay, let's do one more. I'm having a hard time understanding you. Okay, no problem. President Street and Piers, a speckle of the largest story is the high store on the Brooklyn War, when the boats were stored bad. Do you want to save it? Okay, so for this project, I was thinking about the water as a non-human witness to human history. We know that water literally absorbs human contaminants, but I was also thinking more imaginatively. What if water absorbs or is saturated by human events? What stories might it tell? I decided that water would probably need some help if it was going to talk. So I imagined a conversation between the water of Red Hook and a helpful digital assistant app, something like Siri or Alexa that invites the water to send messages and then translates its gurgles into words. I trained an artificial neural network, which is a form of artificial intelligence, to generate this text by feeding it source text about the history of Red Hook. Underwater hydrophone recordings triggered phrases generated by the artificial neural net. The poetic outcome suggests a mysterious glimpse into the water's muddled memories of Red Hook's maritime past. In a liquid way, human events flow into and impact the Atlantic Ocean, often tragically. This recalls what the Black Studies scholar Christina Sharp has named being in the wake and wake work. Human history is present in this project too because the source text from which the neural net learned language originated with humans. But what I was trying to do with this project was to give the Atlantic some agency, apart from the contamination of human intention. And I mean this in the spirit of the critical race theory scholar Hatem Bazian's comment that we need to stop saying Atlantic slave trade because the Atlantic Ocean was not in the business of slavery. 
certain European nations were. One way that Water's own agency came to the fore in this project was completely unplanned, but nevertheless ended up being one of the best parts of the project for me. An unannounced performer, Tropical Storm Philippe, made a guest appearance. As Philippe, the water quite powerfully upstaged its human counterparts, recalling the ghost of Sandy and demonstrating just how small and inconsequential humans and human intentions like mine can be in comparison. Another happy surprise, and one that still confounds me, is the poetry of this piece, because the AI came up with phrases that I would never have thought to write. Things like this. Was no indication what Red Hook was. The slow of sailors was being local. The center were from the sewer sold the sailors and the guilt of the salvage. This writing is full of lilting rhythm and alliteration, like waves of words, so much so that it seems to exceed what so-called machine learning should be learning in this context, because the source text that we gave the neural net did, didn't have these characteristics. The source texts were all archival materials from Portside, New York's Red Hook Water Stories e Museum. Everything about maritime messaging is garbled, from the neural net output to the gurgling underwater sounds picked up by the hydrophone. Even though algorithmic culture tends toward overdetermination and black boxed classification schemes, this piece tries to recuperate some of the muddled poetics of undecidability. Looking at this project through the lens of climate change is appropriate because it's a way to think about the unpredictability of the future and our place in it. Climate change and climate crisis offer a narrative that lets us think about a future without humans. And in my work, I often try to shift the focus to non-human entities. I think that moving the focus from humans and human agencies to non-humans and non-human agencies, agencies which may outlast humans. This might help humans act with more care toward the object world. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's so interesting and just We'll, we'll talk more about this when, when, when this is over, but this idea of water having agency in a way is a, a theme that I think uh, could follow in, in all of these works, is the recognition that if we're not acknowledging that agency, uh, we should be. Uh, our last speaker before we go to questions today uh, is Anina Gerchik. Uh, she is a painter, a landscape architect and public installation artist. As you'll see, her work combines ecological functionality and the enhancement of urban public space with aesthetics. She is most widely known as the creator of BirdLink, a series of deployable sculptural habitats that support migratory birds and urban wildlife corridors. She is also a CUNY alumna with an architecture degree from CCNY. Anina? Hi, thank you. I'm going to share the screen. So the issue that I'm concerned with here is the impact of climate change on biodiversity loss. One million plant species, two thirds of North American birds and unknown numbers of insects are at risk of extinction from global temperature rise. So BirdLink is a public art project in support of biodiversity. This is one of the living sculptures that um, create habitat for birds with over 2,000 densely planted native perennials inside. Bird song is the sign of a healthy environment. Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, recognized that describing the loss of bird song would prove to be an emotionally powerful mechanism with which to build a public understanding of the need to integrate human and non-human urban ecological systems. 
So that urban ecological condition is one of isolated habitat areas that are interrupted by the built environment. And in managing this, Birdling's strategy is to create stepping stones between habitat patches to maintain these wildlife corridors for migrating birds. At four sites in New York City since 2018, BirdLink has made a series of deployable habitats adapted to urban spaces. They've been distributed through public art venues. And now in order to make them proliferate them further, the DIY plans are available at the birdlink.world website. This was the first design prototype. It was monumental, but the carbon footprint was very large and it was also expensive to make. So the first constructed prototype was this one, uh, a much lighter construction and one that was based on a modular system, which is scalable and repeatable and also readable in the sense that we cluster the plants in these units so that people who don't know a great deal about plants can see what they are and understand how native plants, what the native plants are in the region and how they can help the habitat for the birds. This latest prototype variation was informed by speaking with a scientist who studies bird vision at Princeton University. This led to the coloring of the structure itself with an iridescent, as in bird plumage, kind of color, which made it much more visible in the landscape, which is something that not only attracts birds, but attracts people. This one's in the Bronx. The four installations so far have been on Governor's Island and then in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, at Sir Roosevelt Park in Lower Manhattan, and that was partially funded by the National Audubon Society and in the Crotona Park in the Bronx. Here is a quick video to show you how this project first came about at Governor's Island. And this was at the House of New York City Audubon, which was an early supporter. The plants were donated by the Staten Island Greenbelt Native Plant Nursery, and they have continued to help and donate plants at every installation, and I thank them. And this was assembled on site with an internal irrigation system and people who are helping to, to shovel in soil, compost from the Lower East Side Ecology Center and from Governor's Island itself. And then these plants were uh, planted into the spaces between these wires and they grew and they continued. Even after Governor's Island closed for the season, then I moved it over to its next home at uh, Williamsburg at what was then called the East River State Park, which is now Marsha P. Johnson. So BirdLink is a process as well as a sculpture. It's dependent upon local site conditions and exposure to sun, wind, and water. And we see over time how these uh, affect the, the life of it. Um, at Brooklyn, it was on the East River, very cold winds that come across the river on one side and on the other side, was just hot sun. But there was an internal ecology into the design which helped it out, which is that the wettest, the, the moisture loving plants were at the bottom. The shade loving plants had their places in these spaces between gabions and the ones that liked full sun and could tolerate dryness were at the top. So these are really vertical meadows sculptures that help to show what these plants can do if they're not treated as a, an ornamental garden, but rather as habitat. 
Um, and they, so they go through the seasons and provide sustenance in, in all these periods, maybe not so much in winter, but that was an accommodation that this site we had to make. Others could be different. So we're trying to show here that the ecosystem cycles and services are something that the habitats provide. Um, for instance, we know that monarch butterflies depend on milkweed, which we plant, and that black-capped chickadees propagate these milkweed seeds to continue the cycle. Here at Sarah Roosevelt Park, um, where you have London plane trees, which provide very little habitat for, for any bird or insect in the area. Um, but BirdLink is providing ground and mid-level habitat. Shrubs and grasses that are important for bird habitat are frequently removed due to concerns for safety and visibility by the city. So the BirdLink solved this problem by designing windows into it so you would have that visual porosity so it's no Richard Serra here it's quite different the modular construction enables us to have a, a adjustable plan layout the typical one that I've shown you here is 16 feet long 10 feet tall and two feet um, cube gabions but it can be double that size or half and it can be configured in various ways to suit specific sites. The elevations are also adjustable. So there's, there's a lot of design latitude here to play with because this is meant to be available widely and can be designed for small spaces a uh, fire escape or a roof or a backyard, perhaps with the addition of a little seating or in a completely different configuration, which is quite fun. I would love to build this one. Back on the East River here, hoping to get back because there's, that park is under construction. Um, hoping to put a double or triple sized bird link here. And I'm not sure about how the, this is a New York State Park, so I don't know if it'll be different in terms of food plants um, being able to be planted there, but they would work on the lower levels of this and be something that would in, in interest and involve the community of gardeners. So education is part of this platform. Every bird link has a sign and it tells you about the flyway systems and the migratory birds that are most at risk, the resident birds, um, other, other information about um, government policies. And now I'm including QR codes on the sign in the Bronx so that you can connect straight to the birdlink.world website or Cornell Lab of Ornithology, or Audubon, or um, eBird. So we're hoping that people will get involved and, and advocate for science-based environmental government, pol government policy. We were funded by uh, Creature Conserve to work with scientists and study what BirdLink really is accomplishing. So with an urban ecologist, we planted sound recorders into the Brooklyn Birdlink and left them overnight, several nights in the autumn of 2020. And then these recordings were interpreted by an AI program, which was able to identify 18 resident species and four migrants. So this was interesting information. After almost three years of growth, we also surveyed the change in the plants because it is a living system. Volunteers came in and, and other plants went out. I mean, in that place, it, it was a slightly 
challenged environment with the East River right there, but they did great. The insects are in decline as well, but we surveyed in one day 10 pollinators and one non-pollinator at the site. So Birdlink's concept is that rather than just representing the issue, the problem of habitat loss, Birdlink is instigating recovery. And migrating birds are sighted wherever native plants grow, no matter how small the planting area. Its direct beneficiaries, Birdlink's direct beneficiaries are not only human. And that's an important idea about art that it might not just be for humans. But for people, our Birdlink also answers the what can I do question, because you can build one of these. Uh, potential upcoming public art venues that looking towards uh, the, finally getting to the borough of Queens with the New York City Department of Parks, uh, hopefully back to the Brooklyn Park with the New York State Department, and hopefully leaving New York as well to go to the Georgia Museum of Art in Athens, Georgia, and uh, work with a Jacksonville, Florida community. So I sometimes have to remind people that Birdlink is not a zoo. <laughs> you won't see this owl there, but you have to understand it's a, a habitat that brings the possibilities that at night when you're not there looking at it, those birds will be using it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anina. Um, I think if you could stop sharing your screen now, now we can just, uh, go back to seeing each other. Uh, just thank you all of you so much for sharing this work. And I am speaking for myself, seeing them one after the other in relation to each other. Uh, it, each one sort of reflects on the other and gives a feeling that there's, there's maybe some momentum here. Uh, I always knew that each of your work was uh, is trying to do something very important. And I feel like it comes through even more when seen together. It's uh, almost like a curated exhibition this afternoon. So thank you. Um, Catherine and I are just going to take a couple of minutes and just ask each of you uh, a question that we sort of worked out in advance. And then uh, we're going to have time for questions in the chat. Uh, so people who are out there, if you want to take some time now to pop a question in, we'll just talk among ourselves for a few minutes first. Catherine? Hi, sure. So um, yes, thank you everyone for these questions, uh, for these presentations. And we do have questions coming in, a couple in the chat now. Um, folks have been messaging me. So I'm gonna ask all of, maybe what we can do is all of the artists can come on camera if you don't mind. And I think we'll kind of move through these questions that, um, that Julie and I have prepared somewhat quickly. So we'll ask you to give a sort of brief answer so that we also have some time for questions from, um, from the audience. So I will start off with a question for, for Mary, um, which is, you know, you are someone who's very engaged um, with science and scientists, and your work is, I think, so deeply grounded in research. But one of the things that I really appreciate about your practice is that you are really just kind of, as Julie said at the outset, you're not using art to make science accessible for a general public audience. In other words, you're, I think, Think of what you do as sort of interpreting scientific material in a way that is materially and meaningfully transformative in the same way that um, with the swale project you're actually you're also being materially transformative in terms of the community access to food so to me this seems like something that's really going beyond what scientists um, and many probably other people that you collaborate with are doing in their own work so i'm wondering if you would share with us how you approach this kind of research-based practice and how how do you approach interdisciplinary collaborations at, from this position as an artist, someone who is um, working toward a kind of material change? It's a big question. Oh, big question. <laughs> yeah, I think um, so. I think in terms of of research, it's usually a starting point, and then um, and then I, I get 
maybe lost in the more fantastical from there and then try to bring it back home. Um, so maybe the best example of that is thinking about uh, um, like a, a, long, a deep time transition in plant life and how assisted plant migration might spur a change in, in, um, in, in what's growing in a place that might be necessary because climate change is, is really outpacing the, um, the, the projected um, movement of, of plants on their own. So, um, and, and I think in terms of um, um, like, I guess, yeah, what I, what I would hope uh, would be maybe a more regenerative um, um, co-design for cities like New York, where it, where it feels very, where, where our relationship with, um, uh, with our needs feels very tentative and based on larger systems that, that are very much out of our control. So I think about uh, land use in those terms and how, um, how if, if we as, as uh, residents in New York City were allowed to, to be stewards for land, how, how, that, could also, how, how that could feed into our um, regenerative potential for a city. And um, yeah, I think I'll, I, th I thought just to add, I think um, hearing, about, hearing about your work and um, how even when climate change wasn't the intention, the initial impulse for the work, how it just seeped in there just made me think about the, like all of our works uh, that we're talking about today, how they really depend on, on the seepage and on this flow and, um, and modularity and, um, and, and so I think that's, that's also really essen essentially what I think about when I'm designing or co-designing. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So much. Uh, Xavier, I just have a quick question for you to follow up because I'm sure that people would, would like to hear. Uh, if you can just tell us uh, what was your, your role in Glasgow? Uh, how did you come to be there? And I also would like you just to speak very briefly about you know, what your takeaway was, whether what you felt satisfied with in, in terms of going there in the capacity as an artist, I'm sure we would just all love to hear a little bit more about, about that, that time. Sure, so COP is where world leaders come together to try to correct the errors of generations and um, they failed. I was there in my capacity as an observer. I'm a professor of practice at the University of Miami and uh, our university and many universities uh, are allowed to uh, have observers come in. I spent a lot of time um, in the various pavilions where nations uh, have panel discussions, uh, scientists, policymakers. I also spent a lot of time uh, talking to delegates and I saw uh, the American delegation in force, which is different from how it was before when Trump was in power. So I saw literally American leaders, but I also saw a breakdown because uh, unlike what I tried to do with my hello cards, uh, which is we are all one world community and have the sense of urgency to diminish the amount of um, pollution in the atmosphere by half uh, in 2030, um, fossil fuel interests got in the way. If, if, uh, if the fossil fuels were a nation, they would have had more delegates than any nation at this conference. And they won at the end of the day. We had a watered down version. Uh, we wanted to phase out um, uh, coal. Uh, they voted to phase it down. They voted to um, attempt to minimize the subsidies of efficient fossil fuel uh, subsidies. Again, an absurd comment. And, um, and um, we also saw that there were developed nations that uh, didn't want to um, help uh, nations that in the global south that had been impacted uh, by the impacts of climate change without them being the polluters not want to uh, protect them. So it was a, it was a, a really sad moment, but there is, uh, there is an inspiring thing on the chat is Greta's speech. I was standing 20 people deep from her as she spoke after our march of 130,000 of us and told her fellow youth, this is what leadership looks like. And they clamored, they argued, they tried to fight for their future and the present of many living across our earth. And although they ultimately weren't listened to, I know that the delegates in the hall heard them and had they not been there, the things that we did get that we have to report back next year on 
how each of the nations are going to try to meet their 2030 levels. Uh, the fact that the word fossil fuels is still in the document, those things wouldn't happen had youth activism not been there. So the, the, the big takeaway I have is that at a moment when our world leaders failed us, at a moment when the fossil fuel industry still was inside COP at this moment of urgency, at the precipice of catastrophe, um, youth leadership is happening. So in a world of hopelessness, I, I found hope as I marched through the streets of Glasgow with 130,000 other people. Thank you so much. Oh, and, and, and in the link, you'll see two things. You'll see her speech, really powerful speech. You'll also see my conversation with the two very important scientists, uh, one from Oxford and one from, Har um, from um, Cambridge. The Oxford scientist I thought had a really good message. His was, uh, uh, it's not that we wanna make the polluters pay, it's that we want to make the polluters fix it. And, um, and at a time when prime ministers were speaking out of both sides of their mouths, talking about this being the you know, mo moments to midnight, at the same time giving leases to North Atlantic sea drilling, um, a scientist like this explaining what the threshold should be before at least, you know, uh, at least a fossil fuel bar should be given, I thought was, was heartening. Again, a lot of work to do. We are really in this moment of crisis. I think artist voices and the creativity uh, they bring, the way of reframing is uh, is refreshing. I'm so honored actually uh, to have been invited here. Uh, my colleagues on this panel um, are doing uh, incredibly brilliant, innovative work. I'm literally um, inspired by all of them. Uh, and I think uh, the listeners, right, the audience that's listening to us uh, should take that inspiration and continue marching forward. That's the only way we're gonna survive. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, I just I have a brief question for Anina, uh, which is just if you could just explain a little bit more how your work has kind of gotten in through the back door of public art. I know that's something that we've talked about. Uh, what is it about doing this through the idea of public art that has allowed BirdLink to happen? Maybe you just tell us briefly about that, and then we'll turn to some audience questions. But I know I'm I'm wondering about that. Mm -hmm. Right, as a um, person who studied landscape architecture, I I found out what it was like to go through the um, government regulations for building things and capital funding and all the red tape and processes. It's a slow process. So, in order to do what I've done rather rapidly, I found that I could take that hat of public art. And there are places where that can, uh, that, that the doors are open for that quite quickly. So the New York City Parks Department does have a public art program um, and it doesn't fund anything, but it allows the um, parks to be used. So that was my initial entryway in it. I was like, okay, can you got this park here? Can we do this? And it wasn't just the park. The first place I wanted to use was just a um, concrete courtyard at um, in Chinatown. And because the idea is that you don't need land, you don't need cultivatable land, you just need a, a piece of concrete or pavement or whatever, and I can set down this vertical uh, meadow anywhere. But the public art, yeah, it's it's just been a way to start. And um, I, I feel like slowly we're picking up. So now a museum sculpture garden is interested in, in doing it too. So it's, it's got different avenues that come out from it, but it is, um, it's a very important medium. Um, it's why I studied um, landscape architecture at all is because I was a painter and I wanted to figure out how to take my work into the public and public space is its own study, you know, aside from the ecological and there's the policy and, uh, you know, the ways to get into it. Well, clearly you've been able to navigate it. Uh, and I do think, you know, in general, there's some really important things that are happening through that door of public art that does cut through red tape and in some ways can be seen as sort of not threatening. It's it's just an artwork, you know. But actually, you can really get something in there, and um, and I really like Birdlink for that. So I'm going to stop talking now. Catherine is monitoring the chat, and I, we'd love to hear from some of you, Catherine. 
Sure. So we we just have a couple of questions that are coming in in the chat. I encourage everyone to please um, go ahead and add more. Um, but the first question is actually sort of a great follow up to what Anina was just talking about, um, about like how like how can artists do this kind of thing? So this question asks, um, what companies have been supporters or sponsors or clients of your works? And I might also expand that question a little bit. This question is coming from someone who's identified themselves as a as coming from a management education um, background. But I might also expand this to think about um, maybe non um, you know, other partners, right? So companies, clients, supporters, but also um, maybe supporters or um, facilitating um, bodies that are not corporate uh, as well. Um, and that's a question for everyone. I think the, the biggest role an artist, uh, a socially engaged practitioner has is to uh, find opportunities to, um, engage others in um, a problem solving exercise. So I think of, of an artist as a choreographer that looks at what the rhythm is, but you know, so that we can get different people and practitioners and uh, people to, you know, to dance. So to me, the, the most important part of an engaged practice is that, that it's, uh, it's, it's relational. It's how one relates with another. And the role I think that artists have, and we've seen the artists on this panel do that, really effectively, uh, Mary, uh, Mary's work, uh, Nina's work, incredible in the way that you uh, infiltrate spaces, you create, uh, you know, these, these wedges and then come in and in so doing transform uh, the very systems that you're infiltrating. So sometimes your partner doesn't realize what you're doing. Uh, others times they come in with eyes wide open, but in all, in all ways, the relationship, um, you know, the, 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 the development, conceptualizing, bringing people together, um, that is a creative process that improvises on itself to get to result. And to me, that process, I saw that in the, in the slides as well. This is a process, BirdLink is a process. I saw in the process is where the art lives. Yeah, I would just love to add to that. Um that I think we also have a, a great role to play with each other and um, that building momentum in coalitions with other artists and other artists working in, in different places with climate change or, or, or with environmental issues. And it, it just makes the movement stronger. And so that's another, I think, another partner not to forget. And, and I already identified a certain community to begin with as a a partner, and that was the people who are interested in birds. Uh, it's a passionate community, and it's one that, you know, uh, encompasses a lot more than birds because the whole of ecology supports the birds. So that was one way to infiltrate and to open up the thing is by getting a, a passionate group behind the project to begin with. Thank you. Um, so I, we have another question that is asking um, any examples of theater arts addressing the Anthropocene, advice to theater artists uh, wanting to engage with these issues. So this is, I think, a, maybe a call for resources. And Julie, I actually think you might have answers around this as well um, with your work. Uh, actually, there's a professor at the CUNY Graduate Center. I don't want to get her name wrong. I think it's Sarah Sandling. Uh, who just edited a Routledge uh, anthology about theater and the Anthropocene. So uh, there's, there's plenty of theater going on. Some of you may have seen or been aware of San, uh, Sun and Sea, the work that was being performed at the Brooklyn Academy of Music this fall, which had premiered at the Venice Biennale and is now on an international tour. It's a, an opera of people lying on the beach whining about how annoying the uh, algae in the water is making their bathing suits slimy. Uh, and it's just a, a, a really good look at first world um, self-interest and annoyance with the realities of climate change. And it's, 
it actually won the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale in 2019 and really has been hailed as a very important work. So you could Google Sun and Sea uh, from the Brooklyn Academy of Music, you would learn something about that. Uh, but there is definitely, you know, a lot of the work in academia that's being done you know, in, around art and climate change has to do with how we, how we are reached by it and multi-sensory approaches uh, are really important. So maybe it isn't just visual, maybe it is also sound. Uh, maybe it's just, you know, finding different ways of um, connecting with audiences. And theater has, has been a very important part of that uh, and still is. I was artist in residence at the Theater Communications Group, the big national conference for all theater uh, in the US uh, when it was here in Miami two years ago. And there was an entire uh, portion of um, that conference and uh, the organization that's devoted to um, sustainability uh, in theater. And I think that if you look at the link that I just put there and do some researching there, you'll find the theater companies, the uh, playwrights, the folks involved in that green movement within theater. Uh, so that, that's probably a good, a good place for whoever asked a question to, to click through. I, as an artist, I did a bunch of performative work in that conference with folks from theater. So they're really open to it. And I think they find that it is their purpose. I actually think that the theater, that performative component, that experiential learning, especially in uh, alternative and non-traditional places uh, is among the most impactful ways of, of engaging community. Catherine, do we have more questions? Um, we do you have, we had one last question and maybe we can just sneak this in. Um, and I know that we're moments away from 5.30, but um, this was a question about um, how did how did the creation of work change you, the creation of your work? Um, was there something that, that deviated from your initial vision of what the project might be? And have you been changed through your practice? I think in so many ways, I think it's, um, it's, it's like no other experience to, to work in public space and work with, with many people with different backgrounds and interests and knowledge sets. I think, um, you know, you learn so much about what you're trying to do together in so many ways to do it better. Um, I think it's, it's made me like reinvigorated about the potential of art and, um, yeah, I think it's it's nothing but um, change every time you can do a work with other people. Absolutely, I agree that it's a very joyous process to bring people together and to work on a common project and see the the joy that that everybody's experiencing by bringing their piece to it. You know, everybody seems to be. Uh, um, strengthened by it, and I certainly am. I think when we um, started uh, as a species, it's our ability to think in abstract ways that allowed us to um, continue growing um, and building society, building community, and art was what we used along the way. I think art made our species, it definitely transformed it, made it into um, the beings that we are. I know that I am personally transformed every day. I'm also challenged uh, as an artist to continue changing, continue transforming, continue innovating, uh, continue rethinking. I think it is uh, the most athletic, challenging thing any of us can do. So uh, you know, if art isn't changing you, uh, then you need to ramp it up a little bit because uh, I think it's supposed to challenge you and, and, and make you revisit uh, yourself uh, every step of the way. I like the term that you use about elasticity. I feel like that's a really great sort of thing to, to close on today because I think so much of what's happening now is just going to be requiring elasticity of us in so many different ways. And uh, connecting, you know, all of you uh, have worked with other people. You're not working alone. And I feel like those connections are extremely important for keeping people going. 
Uh, it's a known factor for combating climate grief, climate anxiety to participate in something, to join and to be part of something a little bit bigger. It's really heartening. Uh, I found hearing all of you today really heartening. So I, want, I hope that the people listening will maybe take that away and think about ways of, of being involved with other people that share those same concerns. I think Mindy wanted to say a few things to kind of close. So uh, I will just say again, thank you, Xavier. Thank you, Anina. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing your work with us this afternoon. Yes, thank you to everyone. Um, on behalf of the Baruch Climate Action Collaborative faculty in Weissman, Marx, and Zicklin, who have joined together to bring climate education to our community, our Baruch community. And on behalf of the Weissman uh, We Are Climate Action series, I want to thank all of you, starting with Julie Reese, who, um, who spoke with our Baruch Climate Scholars. We have a special program trying to help students get a deep dive into climate change issues. And Julie was gave us a spectacular um, entry to the world of art and the environment and climate change. And it was from that, that moment, those moments that we thought, well, it can't just be here in this small space with these students. It really needs to be expanded. There are so many spectacular artists and you can, you know, we see four of them here today with us who can um, illuminate our understanding, feel, help us feel more connected to the planet, to the environment, to the issues of climate change. But also I think that each one of you have said it in different ways um, that you, this is an opportunity to collaborate with each other, but it's a collaboration with the public. Um, the, everyone needs to feel like they can find a way to be, have some agency, I think as, as many of you said, um, and your art brings people together. And it may be in ways that you can't see because as an example, after our conversation earlier with Julie, she spent time telling me about each of your artwork. So then I heard about it before I, I knew about you. And what will happen today, I, I can't imagine, it's not going to happen. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can only imagine that the, the people who are the audience here today will turn around and they will speak to their friends or their family, their loved ones, or their classes and say, I've got to tell you what I saw. I want to tell you what I heard. And that's because of what each of you spectacular artists have offered us to get today. It was a glorious, splendid, poetic opportunity for all of us. And again, I want to thank Julie Reese, Catherine Behar, Mary Mattingly, Xavier Cordata, and Anina Gerchek for a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon with all good wishes and many, many thanks.